Thank you very much, Bill, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you also for your patience uh, and the Bottle Hill Boys' uh, dilatory tactics to uh, uh, wait until I could get here from modern, fast Newark Airport. <laughs> the subject I'd like to discuss this evening deals with uh, two major problem areas of the country. Not that uh, they can be dealt with in great detail. I think I'm far more interested in trying to convey uh, an attitude or perception uh, of these problems in the hope that a new form of action, which I'll describe later, uh, will emerge. These are the environmental and consumer uh, protection problems that we've read about a great deal in the papers, but still uh, don't appreciate, I think, uh, to the seriousness that they are now occurring and worsening. Environmental pollution is now a, a phrase that's so humdrum uh, in the minds of many people uh, that it's uh, elementary destructive capability and its rapid, rapid, rapidly increasing impact on the nation and on people here uh, has not been, I think, uh, a subject of great sensitivity. Pollution still, I think, in the minds of many people is something that is remote, getting a little closer, a bit offensive, uh, foul smelling, ugly looking to be sure, dirty, but still uh, occurring as if its um, deep erosions uh, have not yet set in on the health of the nation. This, of course, is partly due to the tremendous lag in statistical correlation uh, between pollution in tent zones and the public health. We're only now beginning to get certain correlations, such as uh, uh, between the pollution in Buffalo and the rise of emphysema and other respiratory ailments or the increase of <coughs> respiratory ailments in our slums, a fantastically epidemic increase in the last 15 uh, to 20 years. But if we stop to think about it, uh, outside of traffic uh, crashes and injuries on the highway, environmental pollution is clearly the most destructive form of violence that occurs in this country. Nothing can come close to it, including street crime, in terms of its uh, casualty level, <clears throat> property destruction, and uh, per repercussive impact in the future, particularly on the unborn. We're dealing here with a kind of chemical and biological warfare, a domestic version, where uh, uh, just hundreds of millions of tons of chemicals, gases, and particulate matter are swarming over uh, mostly highly populated areas where industry is, and are developing the kinds of uh, disease patterns and property erosion uh, that can be characterized as epidemic in the strict sense of the term. Uh, take the uh, estimate by the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare uh, about the destructiveness of air pollution. Last year estimated uh, to waste or destroy between 12 and 14 billion dollars a year. Now, there is, I think, no disagreement that air pollution is destructive. Uh, the hassle comes when people try to justify it or say that it can't be avoided or that the technology isn't here to prevent it or that it's too costly uh, to uh, cut it down or the like. But I think it's sufficient if we would just characterize it as a massive form of violence because if we do, we might do something about it. For example, bank robbers last year had their second best year, according to FBI statistics, and they took $8 million from the nation's banks. Uh, in terms of just aggregate, quite apart from the relevant uh, motivation, aggregate loss to the economy, uh, the uh, discrepancy between bank robberies and air pollution destruction is, is vast. And yet, there is far more manpower, inspection, surveillance, prosecutorial, uh, accorded the apprehension of bank robbers then the apprehension of air polluters who are clearly violating existing federal and state and county laws. Quite apart from the weakness of these laws, uh, the violations are rampant. Wayne County in, the, in the Michigan uh, has a, a certain level of air pollution regulations that are violated by many companies, including Ford Motor Company. 
The auto companies are routinely violating the federal air pollution standards in the production of their motor vehicles. Those cars that come rolling off the production lines simply don't meet the standards. <clears throat> Many of them, uh, in fact, a majority of them fail at a level of about 11,000 miles of driving when they're supposed to be uh, good uh, to meet these two hydrocarbon and carbon monoxide standards up to 50,000 miles of driving with one major tune up to 25,000. Indeed, uh, the rampant violation of water pollution laws has become a national scandal. Uh, the federal government passed the law in 1899 banning the dumping of contaminants into navigable waterways. That's the toughest anti-pollution law that has ever been passed in this country. Uh, they used to know how to pass them in the old days. Uh, now they pass laws with delightful titles like Air Quality Act of 1967, uh, but they don't have any effect at all. They're toothless, riddled with uh, procedural delays, and a mockery of any sense of adequate uh, legal control. That 1967 Act, by the way, has not reduced a speck of dust or pollution from the nation's air to date. Uh, this is the estimate by the head of the Environmental Protection Administration himself, Mr. Ruckelshaus. Uh, as far as the 1899 Act is concerned, there are a mere 40,000 daily violators of that criminal statute. And they not, are not only uh, uh, local pigsties dumping refuse into uh, little streams, they're the giant corporations in the country. Indeed, because they control most of the economy, they also produce most of the pollution. We're dealing here with the so-called blue chip companies, like uh, American Cyanamid, Union Camp, Ford Motor Company, Allied Chemical, Union Carbide. These and many other uh, companies are in rampant violation. Uh, in 1969, the federal government discovered the 1899 law for the first time. The law had reached its 70th birthday, undeterred by a single enforcement action. The Nixon administration began a series of prosecutions which now total about 35, some of them in New Jersey. And for the last two years, the 1899 Act has been one of great perplexity for the present administration. In the first place, it represented a uh, total breakdown in law and order. Anarchy was rampant everywhere. There was destruction to precious natural resources and a threat to drinking water as a result of the violation of this law by some 40,000 firms. And the administration had been committed to a hard law and order line, sending their chief spokesman, Vice President Agnew, around the country articulating it. The perplexity came from uh, trying to avoid a double standard. How can you talk law and order dealing with street crime when all right around the corner uh, these companies are violating a criminal statute openly, knowingly, systematically uh, that uh, has such serious consequences on the public health? Uh, this is a dilemma, quite clearly, and it's being resolved in a way that raises a great skepticism about the sincerity of the administration's efforts in the pollution world. Indeed, the administration now wants to give permits, wants to have the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers give permits to these water polluter violators so that they will no longer be considered in violation of the 1899 law. That's an interesting approach to crime. You can see what would happen if we applied it to street crime. All the burglars uh, and bank robbers would line up for permits. It is certainly not a way to fulfill the policy of this act. It's the only act we have in this country that really has teeth in it and it can really do the job. It also had another disturbing aspect to, to, for the administration to ponder. It allowed citizens to sue directly under the act if the government failed to prosecute on notification by citizens of violators. And if the citizens successfully sued, they were enabled to collect one half of the daily maximum fine, $2,500. And this was an intolerable uh, exercise of citizen rights under the law uh, for those in the administration who uh, don't like this kind of legal initiative afforded such a decentralized band of people uh, called the American citizen. It's unfortunate that the attitude 
of government. And the Democrats weren't any better. They were worse in many ways. They hadn't even discovered the law before they went out of office in 68. It's unfortunate that we have such a double standard. It certainly doesn't breed respect for the law. It allows people, in effect, to emulate violators by saying, if they're getting away with it, why can't we? And it doesn't take a genius to figure out that there's something wrong with the legal system that makes it a crime for an individual to relieve himself in the river, but it isn't a crime for corporations to relieve themselves in the river. The point, uh, uh, I think, that has to be made is that the legal system itself, which we rely on, for a collective type of judgment against uh, destruction or poisoning of environmental uh, resources has never been given a chance. It's never been given a chance because what laws have passed have been passed riddled with loopholes and delays, compliments of industry lawyers hovering around legislatures. And these laws have never been given adequate enforcement resources, inspectors, and they haven't been given the political support that's needed for administrators to be uh, a shade courageous in the exercise of their duties against special uh, interests. Now the seriousness of this destruction is uh, proceeding apace. And they have now a new phenomenon called deep well drilling. It's new because it's becoming more publicized. Uh, this is the practice by companies of uh, drilling deep underground under high pressure, uh, the very lethal chemical waste uh, that they do not want to or cannot dump into the water. Where does this uh, waste go? Does it percolate into uh, underground water resources? What does it do to the soil? Who knows? The standards are almost non-existent and there's very little regulation. The first hearings are being held this spring by the government uh, down in the south, New Orleans. But here is a major new area which will probably have to develop into a crisis pattern before the public wakes up to the problem and tries to do something about what's left. The same is true with the uh, runoff and spillovers from pesticides, nitrogen fertilizer, and agricultural waste. In the old days, they used to feed animals on the range, natural-like. And natural-like, the animals would uh, put their droppings all over the range and fertilize them. A few years ago, it was thought to be more uh, efficient to, cat, to gather all the cattle in feedlots, cramming them together and feeding them together. And with the waste being piled up, oftentimes 10 to 12 feet high, until they shift in a kind of minor landslide and run off into the water. The level of agricultural waste here are enormous in terms of what they do to the water. After all, the equivalent of 750 million Americans' sewage comes from cattle and sheep and goats and pigs. But beyond that, the lack of adequate fertilizer on the range is increasing the need for artificial fertilizer, which is more cheaply distributed, and that increases the level of nitrate in the soil, which transfers through the organic cycle into our food supply. Once again, consider the effect on our shellfish and fishery resources. Paper mills, chemical plants dumping mercury, a detailed poison, clearly, into precious water, illegally. Sewage going into our bays, leading to epidemics of hepatitis from contaminated shellfish. I think if we had a list of the areas that are now polluted and off limits to fishing in this country, we would be shocked at the extent of it. As, as basically fertile estuaries with enormous variety of fishery resources have been banned as dangerous uh, beyond the ability of anybody uh, to harvest their yield. In 1968, at a conference that was not reported with the shellfish industry, uh, public health officials noted that there was a, a highly dangerous cadmium level in some oyster batches that they tested. Cadmium is a very serious contaminant linked with heart disease. The public health officials did not make that information public. It didn't reach the public until a few days ago. Now that is a kind of criminal negligence that is too characteristic of people who are sworn by their oath of office to uphold the public health and safety in the federal and state government. 
There is no excuse whatsoever for people to have knowledge in their capacity as government officials of hazards that affect what people are going to eat from a day-to-day -day basis and not make that public at least so people can take their own self-protective measures or call for more systematic self-protective measures. That's one illustration, I think, of the enormous negligence in documenting the extent seriousness of this deadly contamination in all forms of chemicals, gases, and particulate matter. Who discovered the mercury epidemic that now is being located even in drinking water reservoirs? Not to mention streams, lakes, rivers, and bays and all over the country. Was it the government water pollution agencies whose job it was to discover this? No. It was certainly not the industry who persisted in dumping the mercury into waterways. It was a graduate student at Western Ontario University who finished a, a thesis where he tested the bodies of fish, discovering levels of mercury which he communicated to the Canadian government, which in turn communicated it to the American government. It took a student, rather haphazard uh, reliance, a student who did a thesis in order to discover something that thousands of people had some knowledge of and that the government should have had a responsibility to document. How do you uh, detect the impact of mercury? Can you detect it by saying how many people are paralyzed or drop in the street? No. And that is, I think, the first step in understanding why the country is not so seriously exercised about environmental pollution. How do you detect a 5% deterioration in your mental acuity from something you couldn't feel, smell, taste, or see? You can't. Indeed, most environmental hazards, man-made, if they're not invisible, transcend the sensory ability of human beings to detect. This uh, gymnasium could be subjected to radiation now, and who would know it in this room? Can't see it, smell it, taste it, feel it. It could be subjected to 80 parts per million of carbon monoxide. And if some people started getting drowsy or yawning, they wouldn't it would be likely to attribute it to carbon monoxide, which is odorless, colorless, and tasteless. Over a million people crawl into their Corvairs every day and are subjected to carbon monoxide leakage because of a defective heater exchange. They don't know the difference as they paste their little uh, slogans, I love my Corvair, on the bumper. I always thought the issue was whether the Corvair loves them. How many of you have tasted the mercury in your swordfish or tuna fish? Doubt, doubtful whether anybody has. How many of you get up in the morning, turn the water faucet on, fill up a glass, look at it, and say, huh, cadmium level's up today. The point is that all of these chemicals and gases are such that they don't immediately provoke sensory pain or anguish. And obviously we tend to act more forcefully and more unitedly and collectively if, uh, if we're being uh, confronted with some kind of physical harm or threat like a growing fire or a, a, a storm uh, or a street crime epidemic, if you will. But not if it's a chemical or gas. It does not provoke immediate pain or anguish. doesn't provoke the sensory response which signals to the mind the need for action. I think this means that we have to recognize that we've outsmarted ourselves. Uh, physiologically, we're becoming obsolete in terms of being able to detect and cope with the uh, man-made environmental hazards that are being generated. Indeed, this means we've got to do something much more difficult, which is rely on our minds to develop the scientific and engineering instruments to detect and the medical evidence to connect and the legal system to prevent the pollution. That's a much more difficult task. And I think that's the first threshold of awareness here, the need to develop a high sensitivity to these invisible, silent forms of environmental violence uh, that reap their cumulative toll over years and then uh, uh, develop into a medically diagnosed terms such as cancer or heart disease or emphysema uh, without the easy cause and effect connection uh, that people often require for a very prompt response. Take Union Carbide. This is a com company that is one of the most difficult in the nation to toilet train. It's constantly polluting 
in these company towns where it holds the entire grip of the economy of the company town's economic uh, uh, fate in its hands. A company that last year grossed over $2 billion and netted in profits over $156 million. And it has plants in little towns like Alloy, West Virginia, Anmore, West Virginia, Marietta, Ohio, Tonawanda, uh, New York, where workers work in literally inhuman conditions, where their uh, disease and occupational hazard levels, uh, I think, are ca catastrophic, and where the government has turned the other uh, side not to look at it. Indeed, most state governments aren't very interested in worker health and safety to begin with, not the least of which is New Jersey and New York. Uh, last year, all the state governments spent a total of 40 cents per working man and woman on industrial health and safety, mostly allocated, I would say, uh, to inspecting boilers and elevators, which have been uh, pretty well inspected and, and pretty well established as safe uh, in the last half century. It's time to move on to new challenges. Like, like beryllium, bromine, manganese, lead, carbon monoxide, sulfur, dust levels, all the other toxic exposures that blue-collar workers are, uh, are exposed to daily. If you had a line of, say, 70 people lined up all dressed in uh, white smocks, uh, two to one you could probably have, have the capability of, of pulling out the blue-collar workers right away. They didn't come depleted uh, and, in effect, shorn of their health uh, generically. They were depleted on the job. You look at a coal miner, looks like he's 60 when he's really 40. Runs 20 yards, collapses on his knees because his lungs are being strangled by the daily ingestion of black lung, uh, of, of black uh, lung coal dust, leading to the black lung disease, the coal miner's pneumoconiosis. Hundreds of thousands of textile workers, retired and active, working in the, or having worked in the carding rooms, in the textile mills, breathing that cotton dust, have similar uh, lung ailments. These are called bisonosis, which again, the country doesn't recognize as a workman's compensable disease. It's considered something like asthma. The British government recognized bisonosis in the late 30s for their workers and made it compensable. But somehow in this country, apparently the lungs of our textile workers are different. Uh, they don't get the same level of recognition in North Carolina, South Carolina, where other textile mills are operating. And so occupational health and safety hazards are really a simple dimension of the environmental pollution problem. If you want to see 10 times the level of air pollution hovering over Newark or New York, go down into the mines or into some of our foundries. That is where the most concentrated and the earliest form of environmental pollution was. And although it's not categorized as such, it's a little outdated, uh, we have to bring new vision to this because this is quite clearly a, a problem of workers being exposed to man-made environmental hazards in closely congested work sites with very little protection, either in, in, from an engineering point of view or from a legal a point of view. And when companies like Union Carbide, facing uh, continually extended deadlines by the federal government to clean up their plants, uh, put out press releases like Union Carbide did four months ago that they might have to lay off 650 workers from their Marietta, Ohio plant. That's an attempt, in effect, to say to the worker, pollution control of your job, choose. Now that's an extortion and a form of environmental blackmail particularly when the companies have the technology to prevent the pollution, but aren't willing to spend a fraction of their profits, literally, to install this pollution control equipment. We are now being exposed to propaganda from corporations telling us how many multi-millions of dollars they're spending uh, to clean up their products and their plants. If they would only spend as much on pollution as they spend on advertising lying about their pollution prevention activities, we might see some progress. We're now told, for example, that there are gasolines on the market that not only clean our engines, but whoopee, they even clean the air as a double header. Union Carbide uh, <coughs> didn't, uh, didn't invest 10% of its $156 million worth of profits 
That would indicate that those profits or a portion of them were made in a criminal fashion at the expense of the lungs and bodies and health of neighbors and workers. What other institution is permitted to destroy your property values if you own a home or your health and safety if you live in a pollution intense zone like most Americans do, other than corporations? Literally, they are, being, they are given a license to destroy other people's property on the basis that that's the price of business, the price of progress. But why should the victims pay the price? Why don't the perpetrators pay the price? Why is it that the poorer the person is, the bluer his blue collar, the darker his skin, the more likely these people are going to be exposed to the worst levels of pollution? Environmental contamination tracks economic class. Most people who can afford it don't live near their, their uh, pollution intense zones. And that holds true for the presidents and chairmen of the boards of the major corporations of the land. Not one could I find who established his residence near any one of his beloved plants. They established their homes far away in shrubbered suburbs so they can raise their families in less environmentally polluted circumstances. Then why do they inflict their company's pollution on less fortunate families who live or have to live and work in these inner pollution intense zones? One could be old fashioned and say that they're violating the golden rule right off. Of course, if we ever applied the golden rule to corporate activity, uh, there'd have to be a revolution in corporate activity in terms of change. But never quite apart from the golden rule, how about just legal law observance, compliance with existing law? And the alloy in the West Virginia plant of Union Carbide has to be seen to be believed. It generates through holes in the roof one-third of the particulate soot that comes out of New York City in its entirety in one year. This kind of destructive contamination uh, impedes visibility, has people gasping for breath, and is associated with higher levels of disease. Now, by what right? Legal, moral, ethical? Do these companies arrogate to themselves the power not to install proven control equipment to stop the pollution, and instead to choose to decide what kind of air, water, and land we are to use in what stage of contamination. We have to, I think, realize that the country has enormous technological capability that could be brought to play on pollution. Once that capability is understood, the enormity of the outrage is appreciated. Once it is understood that in 1969, according to industry's own figures, the National Industrial Conference Board, corporations spent one-fifth of one percent on the purchase and installation of water pollution prevention equipment. That's not being a very generous neighbor, I might say. How many fishermen have completely lost their livelihood as a result of upstream polluters? By what right do upstream polluters uh, have to destroy individuals or industries' livelihood, like fishermen, without even compensating them. They don't own the river or the stream or the estuary. The public owns these resources. One would think that the figures given by industry about what they're doing for pollution are considerably inflated. When a plant gets worn out and the board of directors decides that they have to replace the equipment, and they replace the equipment in the plant, they say, well, why not say it's all for pollution control? It's good PR. So they replace $25 million worth of equipment, and about a million dollars may involve a pollution control uh, accessory, and they say, well, that's $25 million replacement for pollution control. They don't even net out their costs in terms of their fast tax write-offs. We're seeing here an enormously inflated uh, propaganda machine to try to convince people not only that the company is spending enormous millions, but to try to, in effect, uh, acclimatize people to thinking that since so much was spent for one plant, it's going to take a longer time to spend it for the next plant uh, down the way. The tools that have to uh, follow a prescri prescription here, uh, I think, are quite, are quite available and relevant. First, 
The calculus of corporate motivation is such that unless it costs more to pollute than not to pollute, the corporation is going to pollute. It's just that simple. And it either has to cost more in terms of fines or accelerated taxation against polluters, or it has to cost more in terms of jail sentences and personal liability or demotion or eviction of the officers of the corporation from their recidivist behavior in violating these laws. Both these costs are very legitimate applications of a morally based legal system, which simply says, after recognizing that the adaptation between man and nature, taking millions of years to evolve, cannot be tolerated to be destroyed in a few decades by the short-sighted balance sheet morality of corporations who could care less about the unborn generations yet to come, much less about the contemporary citizens whose lives they jeopardize with their contaminating outflow. Now, I've heard the statement uh, that how could these companies be engaged in such criminal and brutal activity? Why, I happen to know, the person says, the president of that company, he goes to church on Sunday, he's kind to his children, he can be, contributes to his community chest. How could these companies operate this way? Touch. Isn't it true? The institutions can make monsters out of men? That men can have more power through institutions than they can responsibly exercise? How many times do we have to go through history from the 1930s in Germany to the present to be able to avoid that fallacy that the personal traits of an individual toward his family simply don't necessarily transform to the way he is going to use the enormous power that, is, that are in his hands, whether governmentally or corporate, in their impact on society. Sure, many of these people who run corporations smile, they joke, they portray humane virtues, but the fact is that the president of General Motors and the chairman of the board of General Motors running a corporation that took in more money last year than any government in the Western Hemisphere, with the fortunate exception of the U.S. government, have consist consistently refused to put their engineers and scientists to work in a crash program to get rid of the internal combustion engine or clean it up so that it no longer contributes over 50% of the nation's air pollution by tonnage. GM alone contributes over 30% of the nation's air pollution by tonnage by virtue of the engines it persists in designing and the plants it operates. Now this is uh, a dollars and cents proposition. Companies know that much of their technological dilemmas and problems are quite readily solvable if they decide to solve them. That is, if they decide to say, we're going to invest so much with so many technical personnel and here's our target date for completion. Indeed, the statement that engineering capability has reached a point that it can almost program on demand that the inventions required, they can almost put it on a calendar basis, has been made not just by the more innovative industries and their spokesmen, but even by the automobile industry. In 1964, a vice president of Ford told the Purdue engineering audience that point, that in almost anything we can dream up, he told his audience, our engineers can make. We can invent on demand. The auto industry has been on notice for at least 20 years that automobile exhaust is linked with photochemical smog and linked with disease patterns, particularly respiratory ailments. And yet they have continually conspired among one another, literally, According to the Justice Department complaint filed against them in 1969, accusing them of, of, of violating the antitrust laws, conspired to restrain the development and marketing of auto exhaust control systems on their vehicles. This was a conspiracy to do nothing. It was the easiest conspiracy to originate and to administer. And when it was settled out of court, the auto companies, in a, in a deft uh, political uh, move with the Nixon administration, uh, agreed to sign a piece of paper called the Consent Decree, decree, which in effect said that although they will not agree that they ever did it before, they certainly agree that they'll never do it again. 
and thus terminated the opportunity for one of the greatest uh, uh, pollution trials in the century. Laying out the conspiracy of the Detroit Four, as they would probably be called, laying out the conspiracy of the Detroit Four with great detail for Americans to learn how these cuff-length executives in their charcoal gray collars uh, can perform in criminal patterns uh, to keep life-saving technology from being uh, used uh, for making the air more breathable and the water purer. Now, why would they work so assiduously to keep this technology off the marketplace? The answer, again, is quite simple. They've got millions of dollars tied up in the infernal internal combustion engine, which they want to make us feel is eternal. They've got millions of dollars tied up, and they're not about to jettison that investment by putting in a non-polluting engine that's not going to sell more cars or not going to reduce their production costs. If ever you want to predict whether an industry will go along with a consumer-oriented or an environmentally-oriented program on its own, it's got to answer one of two questions in the, infer in the affirmative. Will the program increase sales or will it decrease uh, company costs? If it doesn't, then the only thing that's going to get this industry to apply these life-saving technologies is law. See, legal sanctions, accelerated taxation uh, for polluters, and other legal uh, penalties and deterrents uh, that will get the job done in a more uh, rapid and efficient fashion. The tragedy in all this is that all we're talking about is something like 5% of corporate profits to clean up the environment in terms of its ongoing pollution. This is a true even against the background of years of neglect, thus deferring expenditures uh, to the present in a higher form than they would be incurred if they were spread out over the last 20 years. And so, in the growing despair over anything, over whether anything can be done about pollution, we should keep in mind the following points. One, that the technology is far more available than is being used, and that when the demand grows, our, our inventors will develop even more refined and cheaper ways of recycling polluting uh, materials in such a way that they become commercially useful again. Pollution is often very valuable materials in non-valuable combinations. And two, uh, that it does not take a corporate convulsion to clean up. In fact, it doesn't take much of a convulsion at all. It takes a, a completely newly refined sense of values, but it does not require closing down plants or laying off workers. Union Carbide, significantly a week ago, pulled back on its threat to lay off 650 workers and said they could meet the federal deadline, having discovered coal in West Virginia uh, suitable uh, for its uh, uh, plant, they could meet the federal deadline without laying off the workers. Why did they change their tune? Because there was a public uproar among the labor unions and among Congress and a statement by Senator Muskie he was going to hold hearings next month on what he termed environmental blackmail, that is, companies threatening to lay off workers in order to avoid facing up to pollution control deadlines and get labor unions on their side against the environmentalists. Both of these points, I think, are basis for optimism. Another basis for optimism is the defeat of the SST. The SST was sponsored and put forward and supported by a combination lobby of government, labor, and corporations. That's one of the most formidable lobbies that any citizen can ever come up against. And yet a group of citizens scattered around the country, no more than 20 or 30,000 active citizens, and an active Citizens League against the sonic boom, as well as a number of engineers, scientists, and economists who rallied to the cause to puncture the fallacious arguments put forward by the pro-SST advocates, defeated the SST. They defeated the SST because for one of the few times in citizen history, they recognized that they had limited resources, but they had to apply it at the point of decision-making where these resources counted the most. So instead of having teach-ins in Albuquerque, New Mexico, they descended on the U.S. Congress, and particularly on those senators and representatives that could turn the tide. And they won against not only the combined lobbying of government, unions, and corporations spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, but even against the lobbying of the President of the United States 
who spent a good portion of one week calling up senators and representatives to urge support for the taxpayer subsidy to the tune of $290 million next year for an SST program designed by business, which business didn't want to invest a dollar in because it thought it was too economically risky. I would think that that kind of program should be studied, that victory should be analyzed in order to extrapolate principles and lessons for further uh, advances on the environmental front. Now, quite a part of what we think about pollution, we have two additional responsibilities that should sober our concern. We are responsible to the world. We have the most productive economy in the world. We have the most capable technology to, to reduce the pollution wherever it might be. We're selling highly contaminating materials all over the world, and we produce almost half of the world's pollution. So our responsibility is not just to 200 million Americans, it's to almost 4 billion human beings around the world who live in a thin slice of life, only three miles deep around the world, if you think of it for a moment, where most of the usable air, water, and soil are, just three miles deep. How much can that finite slice of life take in terms of the contamination upon it? Certainly not very much. Our obligation then is beyond our frontiers to the rest of the world. And secondly, what about unborn generations? Who holds the trusteeship for them? Who represents them? Already, children now are growing up in this country who will never have the memories of fishing and swimming and using the natural resources that should have been their birthright. Already, they're finding uh, it difficult to find clean water, to find clean air. What will happen in a generation at the present ge geometric progression in pollution, which is growing faster than economic and population growth? What will happen in a generation when the grandchildren and great-grandchildren come upon the scene? What are we going to tell them? That the United States of America was torn down by corporate radicals on the altar of detergents, on the altar of plastics, on the altar of fertilizers on the altar of pesticides that are sold three or four times in more bulk than they're necessary because farmers are conned by chemical industry salesmen into thinking they need more than they need? Are we to tell them that the country was polluted because of Coca-Cola and the no-return bottles? Because of all the litter that comes out of our supermarkets? That's really quite a significant sacrifice, is it not? Destroy a country? for that kind of outpouring, one would think there would at least be weightier sacrifices as a rationale for such destruction. There isn't. We've got a trusteeship for the next few generations. And let me illustrate one important point. There's an administrator down in Washington called Mr. Ruckelshaus, who heads the Environmental Protection Administration. His only power is in your hands. He is not going to be backed by Congress or the White House unless he is backed by the population. And the greater the uproar, the more organized community action groups are, the more workers, slum dwellers, and middle class Americans get together and realize that there's a common victimization on the job, in the slums, and everywhere else by pollution, the more these laws are going to be enforced rapidly. We could virtually slice water pollution by 80% in less than two years just by applying existing law. We could eliminate over half of the air pollution in three years as we could have 10 or 15 years ago just by cracking down on the automobile. I think it's important to realize that personal experience is crucial here. Yesterday, the governor of uh, West Virginia I showered criticism on our report on water pollution, which came out three days ago, particularly on its comments dealing with the Ohio River, which we considered, based on the evidence, to be one of the most seriously contaminated rivers in the country. He called our claim sensationalism. I think that what's sensational is what the polluters have done to the Ohio River and the fish in it. That's what's sensational. And anybody who is polluting rivers, I think, should have to endure a simple test that if they cannot swim in that river without dissolving, then they should no longer pollute it. That kind of 
I think personal exposure is necessary to bring home to these very remotely cloistered corporate executives precisely what they are doing to the environment. Most of them don't even see their plants. They don't even see the evidence. They don't want to see the evidence. They're upstairs. They like to be able to say someday when they're subpoenaed why they didn't know about this. So how could they be responsible about it? And then you go down to the lower reaches of corporate management and you ask them, why do they do it? And they say, well, we were just taking orders. Where are you taking orders? From the top. You go to the top and they say, well, they didn't know about it. How could they be giving these orders? The runaround, the diffusion of responsibility in the corporate structure, keeping uh, per people from being accountable for the uses of the power that they voluntarily exercise. Now, pollution is clearly a form of consumption, a form of forced consumption. You walk down the street in any city in the country, you are being subjected to a compulsory process of consumption of deadly contaminants. And so it's a consumer problem par excellence. One would think that that is a violent uh, violation of our constitutional rights. It's not only that we should have constitutional rights to speak, freedom of speech and the like. How about our constitutional rights not to have our physiological integrity impaired by forces entirely beyond our control that we cannot affect because we're powerless to affect them. Is there any city street that's safe from General Motors? I haven't found one. The pollution seeps through these cities and people, unless they've learned how not to inhale, cannot but be exposed to the ingestion of these contaminants. In the consumer area itself, we see similar spillovers in our food and drinking water quality, two main consumer products. How long can pollution continue before it begins to seriously contaminate food, as it is beginning to do? Sewage, shellfish, hepatitis, nitrogen fertilizer, nitrates, baby food. How long can this go on before we see that there is no iron fence that says pollution here, foodstuffs there? Ecology has as one of its laws that the pollution will find its level it will go to various areas of the ecology that le people least expect. There's a cycle, an organic cycle that operates here. The drinking water will become one of the hottest political issues in this country in the coming decade. Already in the last six months, there have been tests of urban drinking water supplies showing high levels of mercury, cadmium, arsenic, lead, heavy metal traces, arsenic coming from pesticides and detergents, Already in the Baltimore Re Reservoir, the Lock Raven Reservoir, there have been high levels of mercury discovered in the fish in that reservoir. Already the U.S. Public Health Service tells us 100 million Americans drink water that doesn't even meet the weak federal standards. And now we know that the traditional purification techniques aren't up to screening these non-bacterial forms of contamination. People say, well, if this was all true, we'd all be dropping and on our knees sick, coughing, and the last gas. It doesn't work that way. Pollution does to its victims in a very attritional way. People just, in effect, lose hold of their health. They become sick gradually. Average life expectancy levels off or declines, as it's been doing in the last 10 years. Respiratory ailments go up. Mysterious liver ailments appear. Cancer rates increase. The environment is clearly one important factor in these rising morbidity levels. Quite apart from the property destruction, which can't be denied and can be reasonably quantified. And that, of course, is the challenge. How can we sensitize ourselves to these forms of destruction? Do we have to see a color screen of an urban lung and a rural lung? to see the black urban lung and the relatively pink rural lung and to begin understanding why the difference? Do we have to see these kinds of graphic medical evidences before we wake up to the situation? It's clear that one of the great obstacles to pollution control is our concentration on short-term benefits and our lesser concentration on long-term costs. And I submit that until we develop a core a full-time professional environmental advocate, lawyers, engineers, economists, investigators, whose sole concern are those long-range costs 
then that short-term balance sheet morality is going to run this country into the ground. And it's time to begin educating young children in new dimensions of patriotism. So they don't associate patriotism exclusively with military victories and armaments, and they begin associating patriotism with reclaiming this land right here at home. With, in effect, So that they look up to citizens around the country fighting lonely and often successful battles against overwhelming odds, whether it's municipal corruption or pollution or consumer fraud, as patriots. So that citizenship is identified with patriotism. So that great motivation that's implicit in patriotism is transferred onto this new dimension of citizenship. Our television stations sign off at night almost invariably with canned depictions of jet planes and military missile systems. And that is the association of patriotism at the end of the day. I wish once in a while they would show depictions of what citizens are trying to do around the country to improve the level of justice to all people, to improve the distribution of our very ample resources, and to bridge the gap between this country's great potential and its performance. And perhaps if children began receiving this spirit of patriotism in terms of domestic citizenship, perhaps if our political leaders would invite someone besides corporate polluters to the White House or the governor's mansion, perhaps if they would recognize this act of citizenship throughout the country, then children will begin to want to emulate this obligation to contribute on a day-by-day -day basis to the community. Instead of now, where many towns look on citizenship with the kind of ridicule that is paralleled by the description of a town that has a town drunk, a town fool, and a town citizen. That's got to change. If we're going to be given an opportunity to be citizens in this country, then we've got to look at it as an obligation, otherwise it's going to cease being an opportunity. And citizenship has got to mean something more than what an immigrant acquires as a naturalized citizen. It's got to become considered not just a part-time hobby. It's got to become considered something that workers do on the job when they discover conditions inimical to their fellow man, like defective automobiles or pollution of waterways. What they do both inside their company and what they do to inform authorities outside their company of harmful practices that their company has ignored year after year, even though these workers have pointed them out to them. That holds true for engineers, scientists, and lawyers, and other professionals in these companies, as well as blue-collar workers. That's citizenship on the job. There have been several million cars, defective cars, recalled by General Motors and other companies because workers or inspectors on the production line spotted the defects, reported them to management, had them ignored by management, and then, had, and then made up their mind that their top allegiance was to their fellow man and took their information and sent it to Washington, which resulted in the recall and correction of these cars. That is citizenship on the job. Because unless we say to ourselves, wherever we work, that our primary allegiance is to our fellow man, then we're going to be enslaved by the organization. We're going to have an ethic which says, anything the organization does is okay. We followed orders, therefore we're not responsible. And the organization has the last word. Mankind has the last word on earth. That's where people's allegiance have to be. And that is what can do more to curb the excesses and injustices of large government and corporate organizations than any single factor. When these organizations realize that they can no longer command the blind allegiance of their employees, no matter how destructive or illegal or fraudulent their impact is on consumers and citizens, then they will realize that they had better reduce their injustices and begin to change themselves. When they realize that they have people inside these organizations that are not going to tolerate beyond a certain point these kinds of injustices. The other kind of citizenship is the full-time citizen. And by that is meant professionals and technical people who spend every day during the weekday going around their community, on municipal councils, working on legislatures, in courts, before regulatory agencies, 
defending and promoting the consumer and citizen interest. How many times have you seen the Public Utility Commissions in New Jersey automatically approve uh, utility rates, telephone rates, the insurance commission, the insurance rates? How many times have you seen regulatory agencies cave in Washington, Trenton, Albany, Springfield, Sacramento? Because when these policies are up for decision, who is hovering around these regulators in the state capitol? Special interest lobbyists, lawyers, people skilled in shuffling campaign funds and the like. Who represents at the scene of the action the citizen to persuade, to urge, to exhort, to expose, to sue, to propose? Almost nobody. And until we get a core of thousands of full-time professional strategists representing citizens at the scene of the action, we are not going to turn the legal system in the direction of a more humane and efficient performance. And that is what we're trying to do when we train students in Washington working on these task forces studying government agencies. Studying government agencies, not in government agencies, from the outside. Trying to get them to appreciate that citizenship is a skill. That next year you can be ten times more effective than this year if you learn the skill. The sense of timing, how to get information, how to put it together, who to appeal to, what coalitions to bring on your side, and the like. And once we raise citizenship to the level of a professional skill and provide opportunities, particularly for young people pouring out of our schools with a level of idealism and commitment that hasn't been paralleled in a generation, until we do that, we're just spinning our wheels. We're developing caveats and exposés and jeremiads but nothing really happens until people roll up their sleeves at the scene of the action in this kind of career role. The students in Oregon have decided to do just this thing. Last fall, 70,000 of them signed a petition to the Board of Higher Education asking them to, to, uh, to assess themselves $3 per student per year to develop a fund that students would control to recruit or hire their own lawyers, economists, investigators, ecologists, who would go after the problems in the state in a systematic year-round way, utilizing the enormous but often dissipating energies and volunteer time of the students that back them up. It can become a real force, and a month ago, the Board of Higher Education approved the petition, and this action will probably be underway before the end of the year. You couple that with the 18 to 21 year old vote and you've got the emergence of a young citizens lobby that will have a, a great deal of leverage and power in the society. And indeed, other students, Minnesota, Michigan, Illinois, are following the or Oregon path and are signing similar petitions. And one can envision this kind of movement spreading across the country and invigorating the educational process taking courses at community colleges, four-year colleges, graduate schools, and developing them as courses that concentrate on problems in the community, studying them, analyzing them, gathering to together the data, then dealing with the abstractions in the, in the books, in the textbooks, to see if they're valid or applicable, and developing a strategy of action where the students in the seminar or course, or writing their independent paper, can begin implementing their strategies uh, for a better society. That's the best way to learn. The educational experience that challenges a student's mind and his heart in tandem is the educational experience that will stick and last way beyond diploma time. There is no other substitute to overcome the boredom of students, their wasting time, their kind of enemy. There's no other substitute than engaging students in empirical research on problems that they believe are important, significant, and we'll be facing them in the coming generation. It's a challenge that not only overcomes boredom, as an obligation, and as a skill, and preventing a repetition of this pernicious phenomena that we called the silent majority a couple of years ago, exploited by politicians as if it was an act of patriotism. This country was not founded by a silent majority. It will not be forwarded by a silent majority but by an act of citizenship which refuses to abdicate its birthright in a democracy and replace it with billions of hours before television soap operas, before the telephone, before the bridge table, or before the bowling alley. 
It's that kind of re-change in our time and energies that we have within our grasp now that will begin the qualitative change of the industrial economic system. We've learned that we can produce tremendous numbers of goods. Our production machine is enormous. The question now is quality of the production and its distribution. And government and business are not going to answer those questions. Citizenship throughout the country, organized, relentless, is the only hope of putting quality back into our economic and political machine. Thank you. Uh, if people would still hold their seats, Mr. Nader would like to answer some questions from the audience. If you people are willing to, answer, to ask. Yes. Yes, uh, in the, under the 1899 law, yes, there was a successful suit in New York which resulted in the parceling of the $2,500 fine to the citizens who, sue, who uh, reported the violations. There are about 30 suits uh, pending now uh, throughout the country. Uh, they tend to take over a year for completion. But there are scattered instances where it has been used successfully. In the collecting and processing of what? Is there, you're saying? You, you say there is or is there? A uh, lady says there is a growing business in the processing uh, and distribution of manure as fertilizer. The uh, economic facts of the matter is that nitrogen fertilizer is, is cheaper, as it's presently conceived. Whether it will be cheaper if uh, New systems can be used, particularly out of feedlots, to distribute manure as fertilizer. It remains to be seen. Yeah. Well, it certainly is for, for ecologically minded people who aren't looking for the second decimal point in cost savings. The question is, what choice do we have when we have uh, pests like the gypsy moss, moss uh, in using pesticides like seven to uh, eradicate? Three points. One, more pesticides are used than is necessary. That is, we can cut down on pesticides just by cutting down on the fraudulent representations of salesmen to try to get farmers to believe uh, that they need twice as much per acre than they actually need. Second, the pest, the uh, the uh, spraying itself can be done much more efficiently. First of all, it can be done more carefully so it doesn't end up spraying uh, uh, playgrounds and homes near the uh, area of, of uh, maximum exposure to the uh, pesticide. And second, there's a new technique now being developed where by a, a positive and negative charge, they, they in fact charge the uh, chemicals, uh, the uh, pesticides come right down, they don't dissipate and evaporate and are taken by current. So you have to lose, use maybe 30 or 40 percent less on that basis alone. And once we get down there, we have very radically cut down the use of pesticides without cutting down the benefits. Once we get down to benefit use, then we've got to deal on a longer range basis. Uh, first of all, uh, is it valid to use pesticides prophylactically? Most specialists think this is nonsense. You don't use prophylactic, uh, you don't use uh, pesticides in a preventive way, not the way to use them. The second is, are they killing off natural predators, which in effect bring next year's uh, pests in a more virulent form because the natural predators are gone. And thirdly, 
Uh, how much money is the country putting to develop biological uh, controls of pests, which are non-chemical controls of pesticides, sterility inducement and the like? It turns out the U.S. Department of Agriculture has been very lukewarm and, lu and very uninterested in, in developing biological controls because it's the prisoner of the chemical pesticide industry. Need it be said anymore that the Pesticide Regulation Division, which finally was taken out of the Department of Agriculture into the Environmental Protection Administration in December, that for 20 years it had the most serious evidence of violations of pesticide regulation in its files, and it never once prosecuted or asked the Justice Department to prosecute a violator. The Agriculture Department has no interest in this. So that's the kind of scale of analysis that we proceed to cut off percentages and segments of the use of, of pesticides and, and for a longer range uh, displacement of pesticides by non-chemical control systems. Yes? Well, the question dealt with the musky bill. What musky bill? The water pollution? Oh, the air pollution bill. Uh, it certainly is an advance over past musky bills, which were, which were really fraud. Uh, at least it has a 1976 maximum deadline on the automobile exhaust to be reduced 90%. That was a big struggle, and he certainly supported that all the way to his credit. Uh, it, it has stronger penalties as well. But uh, so now we have uh, overcome one minor hurdle, that is at least the law has some enforcement piece to it. The next hurdle is, are they going to enforce it? And this is where the Nixon administration is still a question mark, whether they're going to enforce it on stationary pollution sources as well. Factor. The question uh, dealt with uh, the views on nuclear power as an alternative to uh, electric, fuel, electric energy plants burning fossil fuels like coal. Well, I think, uh, first of all, that there needs to be a moratorium on the further construction of nuclear power plants for two reasons. One is the deep evidence that the Atomic Energy Commission has, been not, has not been telling the truth to the American people and has been deceiving them. Uh, both about the safety of their, their transporting and uh, depositing of hot radioactive waste and the way they, they deposit them and what kinds of containers. And second, about the day-to-day -day radiation emissions. And third, about uh, the uh, AEC's statement that it doesn't make any difference whether power plants are built near population areas or far from major population areas. And fourthly, and most seriously, the AEC's downgrading of the risk of the big accident. The big accident is when there is, in effect, a catastrophe inside the nuclear power plant which releases radioactivity into the air. And the, sa the safeguards there in the judgment of some AEC scientists who are rebelling against their own commission is that the standards need to be made 10 times more stringent. The big accident is a Hiroshima or worse. It's not going to blow up buildings, but in terms of radioactive contamination, the big accident from any one of the nuclear power plants in and around New York City could wipe out hundreds of thousands of people. And the question is, do we want to put near cities a, a, a structure that even if it's a low probability of occurrence, has such a high level of total catastrophe should it occur? We've had some close calls in nuclear power plants. The Fermi reactor outside of Detroit was shut down for a year and a half in a narrow escape from a major accident releasing radioactivity over Detroit. The Hanford works of the AEC had a, a type of accident that shouldn't have occurred uh, in a billion years. You know how the scientists say, the chances are one out of 58 trillion, and everybody sits back consoled. Well, 85 things went wrong at once that weren't supposed to go wrong. The only thing that stopped it from being a catastrophe was that one last fail-safe plug, in effect. Back at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, 
Some people were testing that fail-safe plug once, and it fell apart on them. Now, what would happen if those two things connected up, we would have had a major disaster. The AEC wanted to approve the building of a nuclear power plant in California over the Bodega, over near Bodega Bay over the earthquake fault before it was stopped by an aroused citizenry led by some scientists in California. Its credibility is shot. It has a conflict of interest because it's expected to promote nuclear energy uh, here at home, and it's also supposed to expect it to promote the safety. There's no other Western country that puts in one agency the power to promote and the power to regulate the safety. And that has to be split off from the AEC and put into another agency that doesn't have that conflict of interest. I think against all of this, uh, uh, we need to have a moratorium on the, uh, the, per the licensing and construction of nuclear power plants. You can't very easily renovate a nuclear power plant. Once it's designed, it's pretty much fixed. Yes. I can't hear you, man. Would you? Do so I feel that population has any effect on environmental pollution. Of course it does. In fact, if we didn't have any people in this country, we wouldn't have much uh, pollution. What, is that, what else does that tell us? <clears throat> the point I think to recognize is Population growth is enough of a problem in itself without saying that all other problems will not be resolved unless we resolve population growth. Not in this country. We can cut down pollution uh, from cars by technology. We can cut down pollution from plants by technology. However we may want to order our population growth, we can have twice as much pollution with half the population or half as much pollution with twice the population depending on how we control our technology. Yes. Yeah. Status of the Alaska pipeline is now under further study. Even the Army Corps of Engineers uh, thinks that uh, there are un undecided issues that require delay of approval. And there are now suits uh, against uh, the construction of the Alaska pipeline with uh, some very influential lawyers in New York representing, for once, uh, the uh, environmentalists and the Alaska natives whose lives would be most affected by it. I think um, what we, it could be another SST. And what we need, I think, is a, a more, more detailed fact on whether it's needed in terms of it's being built, whether there are alternatives to transporting the oil, whether indeed we have to develop those oil resources at the present time anyway. Clearly, there have to be more stringent safety standards in the construction of the pipeline itself. That has, has pretty much been decided uh, by the authority. Yes. No, because uh, most countries are operating under the same a profit motivation, whether they're capitalistic, so-called, or socialistic. A plant in Russia operates under, in effect, a budget, and it's got to produce a surplus, and it's got to pay attention to plant costs. And if that plant manager isn't given the message loud and clear by the environmentalists in the Soviet Union, he too is going to dump his waste into the Dnieper River, as indeed has been happening. Back there. Question would I comment on the effect of this in the New Jersey delegation on pollution in environmental areas? I certainly wouldn't describe them as militants. <laughs> uh, it would be interesting to be able to rank them according to other states. They certainly have a lot to work on in New Jersey. Probably one of the eight worst polluted states in the country, easily. Uh, but. Uh, now, they don't uh, shine, let's put it that way. They do not shine in the Congress. It doesn't say that they're the worst, but it does say they're not outstanding. 
In the Occupational Health and Safety Area, Harris Center, Harris Center Harris, Harrison Williams has been one of the leaders. But that's the kind of environmental pollution, so it shouldn't be shrugged off. But outside of that, uh, nothing particularly outstanding. Yes. Pardon, sir? Uh, the question is, what about the AEC tests, uh, underground tests, and the Aleutians? One comment is simply the following. One of the problems when a, the AEC tests in a state, and assuming it was testing here in New Jersey, why should the AEC have the sole decisional-making power to decide when, where, and what the conditions of testing are in a state? Why shouldn't the state share in that power? How are the people going to have uh, control over an arm of government that's a little more accountable or closer to them if the states don't share in, uh, in deciding with the AEC about the conditions and frequency of testing? That's a very elementary point that Nevada never seems to have realized until it's too late, or Utah, which gets the spillover so regularly from the Nevada test. Uh, as far as... Uh, the issue of disarmament and underground testing and so on, I have to defer on that. It's pretty far afield from, from this particular area. Yes. I can't hear the second question, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the, the first question on uh, spraying uh, of Severin against the, on the gypsy moth here in New Jersey, uh, I'd have to study it more closely, right here in New Jersey. We're coming out with a major pesticide report uh, in about three weeks, which deals with various areas around the country. Unfortunately, not the New Jersey situation. Oh, yeah, no, there's no question about that. Sure. Mm -hmm. Question, you're, uh, let me rephrase it. You're saying that a couple of years ago the government permitted the smaller jet planes, 727s and the like, to use a cheaper jet fuel? Yeah, I'm not aware of that happening. I'm, I'm aware of jet pollution and what the government is trying to do about it, which is very little. Uh, the, main, the main thing that's being done is to make sure that you don't see it. See, right now you see these planes taking off with black soot coming out. What they're trying to do now is, in effect, put the cosmetics in so that you don't see all it. You take out all that black soot, uh, but uh, the residual gases are still coming out. But I'm not, I'm not aware of, uh, the de of a permitted degradation in the quality of the fuel that's used. I'll certainly look into that because that's one of our areas of concern. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll look. Uh, who have I called on before? Yes? What about the detergents on the market? Are any of them really less polluting? Yeah, there are some less polluting. Uh, the, less, the, the best detergent to use is, a, is no detergent. 
for about 150 years, you know, Americans got along without detergents. The country didn't collapse. And although you can real, we can appreciate the great mission of uh, getting every speck and stain off Junior's bib, uh, uh, we've got to realize that the cost of using these detergents far outweigh their benefits. Now, there are some detergents that have a lower phosphate level. Those are the ones, if you're going to use phosphate detergents, use the ones with the lower phosphate level. There's a group in Washington called Concern Incorporated that sends out little cards that indicate which ones are best to use and the like. All right, now about the new ones. Some of them are outright frauds, and some of them are harmful. Some of them are being subjected to prosecution by a federal authority. Uh, it's, a no, it's a no man's world. And until uh, the government, in effect, cracks down, we're going to get every little offering saying, look, it, this cleans up, uh, this doesn't harm the environment, but you'd be surprised what it might do to your respiratory tract or your hands. Now, we've got enzyme detergents, which have been shown to be harmful to workers and to some housewives who are exposed to the, uh, the, the uh, ingestion of what comes out. And this is... Uh, something also the housewife should be very wary of, the use of enzymes. Furthermore, it's been shown that the enzyme detergents claims are not fulfilled. They don't do the job that they're highly touted to do. Well, I think for many aspects, go back to, you know, regular old-fashioned soap. For many, many aspects. We've become detergent crazy here. The women's liberation movement wants to do something dramatic and quick, is to get off this detergent kick that's associated with a kind of simple-minded woman running around the kitchen uh, in, a, in a stupid Madison Avenue advertisement. It's just unbelievable. The way, do you know that Procter & Gamble spent $250 million advertising its soaps and detergents? That is two and a half times what the federal government spent in 1969 on air pollution. The entire air pollution program, research and enforcement. So we've got to... Uh, begin rejecting these in the marketplace to begin with. Some of these detergents are coming in, they're low in phosphates, they're no phosphates, but they're high in sodium salts, which are also a problem. We've got to question the very use of detergents to begin with, just that basic. Yes. Something about the dangers of noise pollution. Something very interesting has now been revealed. In the last year and a half, uh, the studies that have come out have shown the physiological impacts to noise pollution. We think of noise something that irritates us, annoys us, keeps us from hearing other things. We now, and perhaps damages our hearing. There's a professor that tests income in University of Tennessee freshmen. He finds that 20 to 25 percent of the freshmen have the hearing level of a 60-year-old man. And it's not all due to rock bands. Beyond that, now, more and more evidence is, is showing that, for example, noise has an impact, particular impact on people with heart trouble, has a physiological impact uh, on the tiny infants undergoing rapid neurological development in the few, first few days and weeks of their life. So, in answer to your question, uh, the more that the studies have, the more studies have come out, the more that issue of noise pollution is becoming far more than an annoyance but a major serious environmental hazard. And needless to say, the decibel level is increasing. Uh, in our cities, it's enormous. In our foundries, in our textile mills, the only way you can appreciate it is to go see these foundries and textile mills and then ask the worker, how can you tolerate this noise? You know, hey, how can you tolerate this noise? And the worker says, funny, I don't even hear it anymore. You see? It's like the taxi driver in New York. I said to him, how can you take this? Stop, go, stop, go, traffic, swearing, congestion, pollution. He says, son, I don't even see it. I don't smell it. I don't feel it anymore. It's all part of my life. I've adjusted to it. Tragedy. Psychologically, he's adjusted to it. His lungs haven't. His body hasn't adjusted to it. And that's the big gap. Psychologically, we can adjust to inhumane environmental hazards, but physiologically we cannot. And what is it that generates our mental concern? It's either our threshold of pain, which isn't activated by pollution, or it's our psychology or our mind. That's, the, that's you know, something that isn't as abstruse as it might sound. 
We've got to bring the two together. The only way to do it is to absorb the evidence and develop the sensitivity based on the scientific instruments of detection and the like and go to work to do something about it. I'm told the time is up. Thank you for your patience.